Hello, good evening, welcome, everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to start now the conference about uh, sustainable urban mobility. Uh, first of all, I will uh, I, I would like to thank to to UPC School for for all the support to give us to organize this open talent. Every year we select a topic of our master degree in urban planning and sustainability and climate change and share it with the community. So it's an open conference to the community and thank you for coming in this rainy day. No? Um, last year we talked about the happier cities and the smart cities, but this year uh, we choose to talk about uh, urban sustainable mobi mobility because we think that it's a key element or problem, depends on the point of view of, of our cities in the 21st century, uh, since the cities have been designed for cars and not for people. Mm -hmm. So uh, a sustainable mobility mo model should be a healthy and low carbon model that uh, prioritizes the quality of urban life and the collective well-being. Um, I don't know if you know, but in Barcelona, the mobility, almost the 42% the uh, is non-motorized. That means that we walk a lot in Barcelona, no? And the 35% 35, uh, 35 uses public transportation, and the 23% is private mobility, car or motorcycles. Also, the city strategy is uh, to boost the sustainable mobility, uh, especially the use of uh, bicycles. In other hand, the urban mobility plan of Barcelona includes the, an expansion of the bike lanes in the city, more than 80 kilometers. Uh, moreover, in few years, Barcelona have reached uh, almost at 2% of the total urban journeys, journeys by bike. So we think that we are in the mood of urban cycling. <laughs> hmm? That's why in this year I, I invite Michael, and thank you Michael for accepting my invitation. Uh, he's an expert in urban mobility. Um, he's uh, one of the leading global voices in urban cycling. Uh, he's urban designer and, and CEO of Copenhagen Ice design company, which he founded in 2009 in Copenhagen, Denmark. And he works with cities and governments around the world in, coach, in coaching them towards becoming more bicycle-friendly cities, especially the Copenhagen Ice Barcelona office with Michael works with the metropolitan area of Barcelona and the government of the city of Barcelona um, to get a better city for bicycle. Um, I don't know. He uh, he's an, uh, he has he's released a f his first television series, the Life Size City, <laughs> uh, offering a fresh look at urbanists around the world. So, in brief <laughs> words, thank you for coming and all yours. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. I, I forgot to, to tell you that at the end of the of the lecture, we have a glass of wine and some snacks, so don't go. Oh, I'll stay for that <laughs> shit. Oh my God. <laughs> That's all I'm going to remember from... Uh, the first thing I need to do is stand up because I'm basically 12 years old. I cannot sit, sit down for that long. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, I always enjoy coming to Barcelona. Uh, it's one of the cities. Everybody says, oh, what's your favorite city, Michael? And I always say, I need three cities to have a favorite city, and it's Copenhagen, Montreal, and Barcelona. And, uh, and all my friends here know how much I, I talk about Barcelona um, and how much I love this city. So hopefully what I'm going to say over the next 45 minutes or so, uh, it, it comes from a personal experience of this city as well as many other cities around the world. Um, so first of all, a little bit of introduction about Copenhagen Eyes Design Company. As you said, uh, we work with cities around the world uh, in how to become more bicycle friendly. That's the, that's the short description that I say in a bar. What do you do? Oh, I work with cities around the world to be more bicycle friendly. Um, but we have, uh, we have offices in, in Copenhagen. We have a, a, a French office and we have an office in Montreal and we have an office here in Barcelona. Jordi from our Copenhagen Eyes office is here tonight. Um, 
And uh, what we do is we basically, we plan, we design the infrastructure for cities. Uh, we work with planning and infrastructure and policy, also communication, but uh, one, of the, one of the, some of the cities we're working with at the moment, oh, I gotta stop doing that, don't I? <laughs> That's what you said. Um, some of the cities we're working with at the moment include Paris, Strasbourg, Detroit, Long Beach, Amsterdam, then there's Toronto and Montreal. There's a lot of cities. The point is that there's a lot of cities who are trying to do this, trying to put back the bicycle as transport in our cities after you know, maybe 50 years where we forgot about the bicycle. Longer in some cities, shorter in, in others. But every city in the world is talking about the bike. 10 years ago, no cities were discussing the bike as transport, but now everybody is. And this is a re it's really one of the most interesting ages in urbanism. Should I stand over here for that sound? Okay, cool. Um, so the, one of the jobs we did recently was Detroit, uh, a city that is trying to reinvent itself after 1.1 million people left. So we have designed their entire bicycle infrastructure network for hopefully the next 200 years of transport. They want to be the mobility city instead of the motor city. It's a really interesting age uh, for Detroit as well. The point is that everybody's doing this. Uh, the other point is that every time we wake up in the morning and go to work, all of us at all of our offices, uh, none of us are cyclists. None of us identify as a cyclist. We are just modern city people who happen to use a bike to get around because it's 2018 and because we have done it in cities for so many years before. So, you know, I talk about bikes for the next 45 minutes or so, but I am just a regular person living in a city and there's a lot of me in every city in the world. Uh, today in Copenhagen, uh, I rode my bike to the airport. It's only 11 kilometers. I have this old one speed bike, an old vintage bike, you know, and I'm just wearing these clothes. I don't have any of the gear. None of us have sports bikes or anything. Uh, that's great, but I mean, what I'm gonna talk about is cities and transport. Um, we also do some master classes. Uh, we have one every June in Copenhagen, but we also do uh, sort of mini master classes. And the city of Barcelona, before Christmas, they came uh, to Copenhagen. People from the mobility department, some police. Uh, Bispa, no, what's the name? BIMSA, people from BIMSA. Um, and we, they all came to Copenhagen and we just showed them how things can be done. And they came back rather inspired. So hopefully they're gonna do uh, the right thing going forward here in, in Barcelona. Um, so yeah, I have to establish the baseline. I'm not a cyclist and uh, cities are for me the same. Barcelona in many ways is not Copenhagen. It's not Toronto, it's not Buenos Aires. It has a very unique identity. And that's amazing, and that's how it should be. But when you boil it down, and we're working with urban planning and transport planning, um, it's really important to simplify. Cities, what are they? They are just an urban space populated by homo sapiens who have to go from A to B to C and back to A. And if you make it that simple, it makes it much easier to envision uh, a city like Barcelona with the levels of cycling that we have in Copenhagen or another city in the world inspired by a, you know, a completely different city. There could be a Tokyo in Toronto, there could be a Buenos Aires in Ljubljana. I mean, everything is possible if we boil it down. So let's keep our, our pride. You know, if you're from Barcelona, yes, it's different in so many ways, but when we're talking about planning, they're all the same. And if we think about that, it makes things easier when we go forward. So my main philosophy is that, you know, we've lived together in cities for about 7,000 years, right? We're kind of, we're kind of uh, professionals at, at living in cities together. And for the 7,000 years, the streets of our cities were the most democratic spaces in the history of Homo sapiens. We've never had spaces that were more democratic, more owned by the community than our streets. We did everything in the streets for 7,000 years. We transported ourselves, yeah? But we also, we bought things, we sold things, we flirted with guys and girls, uh, we found our partners, um, we, we gossiped with our neighbors. Our children played in the streets. That was their playground for 7,000 years. And uh, you know, they, our, our streets were like our living rooms, right? Small apartments, we all went out in the street and, uh, and, and, and interacted with our community. 
some of the, you know, the Mediterranean cities, the Latin cities still maintain that strong connection with the street, uh, even though we've had cars really uh, for 50, 60 years. Other cities in America have completely forgotten that democratic space. The thing that happened back in the late 1800s and the early 1900s was that cities expanded massively. And all of these people moving to cities, this urbanization created a lot of problems. And engineers were the heroes of the day. They were figuring out how to get electricity to the, all the homes, sewage away from the homes, water to the homes. They were doing an amazing job in establishing our cities as we know them today. When the car was introduced, it was invented and it was introduced into our cities, uh, engineers were the only people that we could turn to because there was a massive traffic safety problem. Cars just started killing people from day one. Um, and, and, and nobody had a solution for this problem. So engineers were handed the job. You've, you're doing amazing work, so can you fix the traffic safety problem? And uh, they went to work. But what happened is very important. From one day, the streets were a democratic space, and the next day they were put into uh, um, a, a category of a public utility right, like water or electricity. And when you look at a public utilities, it's a lot of engineering, it's a lot of computer models, mathematical models, and that was a massive change in our perception of streets. Our space, and then it became the space of the traffic engineers trying to figure out how to make all the cars stop killing people and flow more smoothly. Um, and that, that perception, after 7,000 years, it changed almost overnight. The automobile industry was another key player in changing our perception of the streets. When the cars appeared in our cities, everybody hated them. There's, there is a phrase called the anti-automobile age. Between 1910, 1935, there's this little period of time in human history. If you drove a car in a city in, in America and you, you killed a child, which happened a lot, uh, you could almost get pulled out of your car and beaten because people in cars were just the worst people in a city. That's changed. <laughs> now that's changed drastically in, our, in, uh, in, in, the, in the time since then. But the automobile industry had a problem. Everybody hated their products, but they had these products that they want to sell. And so they started to use techniques that they still use today in marketing, in, uh, in sp you know, spin, and also in name calling. In America, the word jaywalking. Uh, means that you're crossing the street in the middle of the block instead of going to the corner and waiting for permission to cross the street from the engineering department. You know, crossing the street in the middle of the block became socially unacceptable because the automobile industry in America gave it the name jaywalking. A J was a very negative term for somebody from the country, right, who came to the big city and didn't know how to move around with all these people. So it was a negative term. So they started branding people who were crossing the street in the middle of the block as jaywalkers. So they were calling them names, as simple as that. They had Boy Scouts handing out flyers and, and, and leaflets to people, you know, saying, don't cross the street in the middle of the block, you have to go to the, up to the corner. And um, this took about 20 years, and that's really a short amount of time in the history of cities. And after that, we all just did what we thought was proper, what they told us to do. People were herded up to the to pedestrian crossings to use these new things called crosswalks. Children were put into playgrounds to play. This was the last great bastion in American traffic planning. The angry mothers were tired of their children getting killed on the streets. And the automobile industry in America actually invented the playground that we know today that I grew up in, that you all played in when you were children. This was an invention of the automobile industry to get the damn kids off the street, put them somewhere out of the way, and the mothers would be happy. Okay, great, my kid's not going to die. You know, the slides and all the things. This is, an, this is was invented to get children off the street. And what happened then was the coast was clear. All the irritating, squishy obstacles were taken off the streets, and it was, it was, uh, you know, it was, uh, the, the streets were clear for cars, to start dominating our cities. This was the greatest paradigm shift in the history of cities, in the history of homo sapiens, really. Um, and and this, is the, this is the baseline today, you know, oh, we can't put bikes in the city because there's no space. That's because there's cars there. 
but I mean, you know, the cars never used to be there, so we can actually start reducing the number of cars and make space for bikes. But we just, just we blindly look at the city and go, no, there's cars, we can't do anything about it. This only happened in the past 70 years, after 7,000 years of urban history. For 7,000 years, I could, if I needed bread, I could walk across the street to the bakery. Oh, now I have to go all the way up to the corner and wait for the, you know, to cross and go down to the bakery again. I mean, this was a massive paradigm shift, and we're still living with, uh, with this negative uh, legacy today. But the streets are beautiful. They're, they are the skeletal structure of the city organism. They are the, the veins that pump the blood out to all the corners of the urban landscape. Streets were beautiful for 7,000 years, and they can be beautiful again. This is my favorite quote, and I can't say it enough. The fact is that automobiles no longer have a place in the big cities of our time. I wish this was my quote, but this is a quote from a mayor, and not the mayor of some little Danish or Dutch town that you've never heard of. This is the mayor of Paris for 12 years, Bertrand de Lannoy. And he came into power as mayor, and he said, you know what, I want to make my city nicer. And he started, really, an urban revolution that is still happening in Paris. Bicycles were at the forefront of his revolution. You know, there's 20,000 bike share bikes uh, in, in Paris. He was calming the streets. In 2020, 85% of Paris will be a 30 kilometer an hour zone. Amazing things that this, I used to live in Paris in the 90s, and I can tell you, Nobody believed this could happen, and uh, it, it is happening right now. From nowhere, Paris is now at 5% uh, on bicycles, from zero, basically. The bicycles had been pushed out, and now they're coming back. This is a sign that we're moving towards a new paradigm shift. When you have people like that saying things like that, we're moving into a new urban age, and it's a fascinating, interesting age. He's not alone, Bertrand. Mayors in New York, in Vancouver, in Buenos Aires. I mean, this is something that we're hearing a lot of politicians talk about, which makes it even more interesting. So, some misconceptions about cycling. What I'm talking about is not the spandex with the helmets doing the, the crazy rides up in the Pyrenees on the weekends, you know, counting how many kilometers they ride, um, measuring their, uh, you know, their output and their, you know, how, how hard they're working and everything. This is about people like us riding bikes in a city. Uh, cycling for the 99%, just for the regular citizens of our city. Um, it's not also not about who is cycling now in Barcelona or any city, it's about who could be cycling. In every city in the world, there is at least 25% of the population that's waiting for us to build the infrastructure and to do it well, because they will hop onto a bike. In other cities, you know, and that's minimum 25. In some cities, it can go much higher than that. So this is what I'm talking about. Not the weekend riding, but going from A to B in the city. One of the misconceptions in planning, in urban planning in many cities, in many countries in the world, is, and especially in America and, and, and sit in countries like that, is that bikes are put into the same category as cars. I don't know why. Oh, they have wheels, so they should all just, and they move a bit quicker, so let's put them over there together, and pedestrians are over here. In Danish planning and in Dutch planning, bicycles are in the same family as pedestrians. Cars are a completely different animal in the zoo, okay? And you can see, this girl on the, on the left, I photoshopped this really badly, but if you take away the bike, she's just running for the bus, you know? All these people heading home in a snowstorm in the winter in Copenhagen, you take away the bikes, they just look like they're pedestrians walking a bit strange, but they just look like they're walking home. That's what it should be like in a city. Not the, the cyclists who want to go crazy fast and everything, and uh, it's just about the regular citizens. So some of the philosophies that I talk about, one of them, this is a short history of traffic engineering. It's kind of for fun, right? But for 7,000 years, we were incredibly rational. We provided our primary transport forms with a fast A to B. We, we designed the fast A to B for pedestrians and maybe horses and carts or something. 1900 came along, the bicycle had just rocked into our cities, changing human society more quickly and more efficiently than any other invention that we've ever invented. Public transport had also appeared, but still we were rational. We were providing them all with a fast A to B. 1920s, cars had appeared on our cities. Still, we were rational. And then, 
in the 1950s in Europe, 1940s in America, and it came out of America like a tsunami wiping out cities around the world, American traffic engineering standards. And we all just adopted it in Copenhagen, in Barcelona, in Madrid, everywhere in the world. We went, okay, the car. We just believed in the car as the only solution for our future. And we put a lot of money and effort into making space for cars. And that is the result. Now, in many cities in the world, the car, or in Barcelona, the motorcycle also, you know, has just been given the fast A to B. And look at everybody else. They're just trying to get around the city. Oh, I've got to wait for the crosswalk. Oh, I have to do four crosswalks to get over to that corner of the huge intersection. Riding a bike is, you know, fragmented, not very cohesive. This is something that we're all still dealing with in our cities around the world. 7,000 years and then bang, 70 years of screwing up. But this is the quickest traffic planning guide you'll ever see, the Copenhagenized traffic planning guide. You prioritize these three forms of transport on the left, and you make driving a car a pain in the ass. Simple as that, right? And, and we, we work a lot in my company with transport psychology. We're urban planners, but we place transport psychology, anthropology, and sociology at the top. And then we figure out the urban planning, and then we find some engineers to build the shit, right? But this is the key, basically, these th in transport psychology, these three transport forms are intermodal. If my bike, I come out in the morning and my tire is flat, ah oh man, I throw it into a bike shop and I take the metro to go to work. I may be 15 minutes late, you know, but I can still easily switch between transport forms. We know from transport psychology that motorists are the last people to change their transport form because they are unimodal. And, you know, you, you, <laughs> I have friends, you know, they, they'll call in work and, you know, yeah, my car's broken. You know, I can't come to work today. And <laughs> the other, the person on the end of the phone's go, oh, my God, fix your car. Jeez, you know, do you need a hug? Wow. You know, <laughs> it's like that, you know, your whole life is ruined when your car's, car breaks. The rest of us are going, eh, whatever. I'll be 50 minutes late. I'll, I'll find another way to get there. So making a car, driving a car more difficult, more expensive, Reducing the travel times is also very important. This is the only way forward. All the campaigns in the world for ride a bike, it's good for you. It's good for the planet. Save a polar bear on your bicycle today. It's bullshit, unless we're doing these four lines, the, the fourth line in our cities. So I know this to be true because I call it A to Bism. Oh, what, what did we say it was called in Catalan? Abismo. Abismo. We tried to translate it. It's really hard to translate. Um, I have sometimes at a conference and the, the translators are all in the back going, oh, what the hell do I say about that? A to Bism works great in English, abismo. Um, it's all that homo sapiens want. Everybody in this room, every homo sapien who has ever lived wants to go fast from A to B. Whether you're going home from work, you're going to pick up kids at the, the kindergarten, you're going for that Tinder date at the cafe and maybe quickly away from the Tinder date at the cafe if it didn't work out for you. All we want, we'll always find the quickest route. Humans are like rivers. We'll always find the quickest route through a city. And we know this to be true because since 1996, every two years, the city of Copenhagen has asked the citizens, what's your main reason for riding a bike? And it never, ever changes. The majority will always say, um, I don't know, it's just quick. You know, in Copenhagen, two million people, everything's like 20 minutes away by bike. It always feels like it's 20 minutes away, even if it's 30. It's just always like, yeah, it's fast. That's why I choose this transport form. Then you have 19% who say, oh, I get some exercise. You know, everybody's saying, you know, I got to get 30 minutes a day of exercise. So I get that while I'm riding my bike with my basket and my music or whatever. So I feel good about myself. Only 6% say it's because it's cheap. And only 1% will say, I'm saving a polar bear on my bicycle today. I'm saving the planet with my transport choice, man, standing up on their box and, you know, yeah, whatever. That's great if they want to do that. But the point is, in modern societies, in Catalonia, in Spain, in Denmark, it doesn't matter where, that's basically how it's always going to look. That's what people want. They want the quickest way from A to B. If you make the bicycle competitive, if you make the bicycle the quickest way to get around a city, any city in the world, doesn't matter how hilly, how, how hot or cold in the winter and, or the summer, people, the weirdest people will be seen on bicycles because that's all we want. Understanding this basic transport psychology uh, is, is, is key to planning a city 
for bikes or for pedestrians, right? If it's still, qu if it's quick to go from the metro station walking down to the city center or whatever, people will also do that. They can combine bikes and public transport. The Beesing pro pro uh, bike share here, Beesing is the same as we have in 1,500 cities around the world. It just connects public transport pedestrians and gives them a fast last mile, right? It's all, it's all the same transport psychology, making it quick. When you do this, you even have 75% cycling all winter in Copenhagen, even on days like this in the morning rush hour, right? It's still the quickest way to get around. We have to change a lot of questions in our cities as we move forward and we move forward fast with urbanization. We have to find new solutions or use old solutions. We have to change the question. Traffic engineers for about 60 years, they've only, we've only ever asked one question of our traffic engineers and that is how many cars can we get down this street? And how can we get more down? And how can we improve uh, flow and reduce congestion? That's the only thing that they've been asked to do. And I know this, I've had like six different engineers around the world come up to me after a talk going, I've only done this one thing. You're telling me there's a new puzzle to solve? I'm an engineer, I'm a problem solver, man. Give me some new damn problems to solve. So we have to change this question. And this is what modern cities are now asking themselves. How many people can we move down a street? Using all this cool stuff we've invented, trams, bikes, you know, buses and all of that. How many people can we move? This really badly photoshopped graph that I made on the, if you can see the colors, can you see that? Yeah. How many, uh, this has 10 times the capacity for moving humans down any street in any city in the world than the model that we just adopted from America in the 1950s without questioning, yeah, we'll do that in our cities. 10 times the capacity. Urbanization <laughs> is a thing. It, it's far more than it was in the 1800s and 19, early 1900s. We need to think rationally and pragmatically, and we have to change the question. One of the other things, just briefly, uh, cargo bike logistics. Jordi from our Barcelona office here for Copenhagen Eyes Design Company started a micro distribution point down on by the, where was it, by the parliament? Catalan parliament, yeah. You know, where all the big trucks dump their small packages that we all buy online, all of our shoes and, you know, things from eBay or whatever. And uh, the, the last mile distribution is by cargo bike. This is nothing new. Every city in the world had a huge armada of cargo bikes doing all of the, the heavy lifting for decades. But this is something that is coming back. This is an example of changing the question. And we propose, we designed some ideas for, this is one of our designs for like a cargo bike terminal. So we ship, you know, in cities with a river or a harbor. So you have a distribution point and they sail up with the electric barges, throw in the packages into lockers, cargo bikes come down, take them out and deliver them to the neighborhoods. We're trying to change the question of logistics in our cities. So yeah, we work with urban planning, but like I said, transport psychology, anthropology, sociology, but also design is a key factor in my work. And human observation, direct human observation. Um, and this is an example of, of how we work. This is the busiest bicycle street uh, in the world, in Copenhagen, 42,000 people on bikes every day. And it's crazy rush hour in the morning, right? If you ever go to Copenhagen, try it, and try not to cry, because it's, it's pretty intense. But the city of Copenhagen noticed that at this intersection, just after the people crossed the intersection, all of a sudden, a whole bunch of them, a couple hundred a day, were cutting across a sidewalk, which is illegal in, in Denmark, on a bike. And they're cutting across to get to a parallel street and disappearing somewhere. And the city went, wait, they have never ever done that at this location in 100 years. Like, why are they doing that now? Other cities might put up fences just to block them from this you know, behavior. Oh, stop doing that, just go that way, you know. And um, uh, the city of Copenhagen, to their credit, they went, no, 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 there's a reason for this. And they, they had people, uh, they interviewed people, they followed people like stalkers, kind of urban planning stalkers. Um, and, uh, and they found out, okay, yeah, okay, we have that huge new development in the south of the city. These people are getting out of the busy rush hour, breaking the law for 100 meters, and then going around the city center to go over there and not the traditional city center. Ah, that's why there's a new mobility pattern in the modern Copenhagen. So what they did was they put in a temporary bike lane. They painted it across the sidewalk and they wanted to see if uh, people would use it and the numbers of people using it just exploded. And they went, great, then we will make it permanent, which is what you see on the right. 
a permanent cycle track across uh, only in this location, but uh, on, on that on that one spot right there. Um, and these are this is what we call in English desire lines, and it is the most beautiful expression in urban planning. Man, we can get technical and stuff once in a while, but man, we have desire lines to make us feel romantic and poetic. It's beautiful. It is democracy. It is urban democracy. The people of our cities are telling us how they want to use the city 24 hours a day. Every moment of the day, somebody's sending a little urban message in a bottle. And it's time for us to listen and to observe, to watch how people are using the urban landscape instead of just putting up fences and just say, go that way, right? It's arrogant to assume that people will do what we tell them to do when we have 7,000 years in our DNA but I have to go over there. Oh, I'm just, I'm gonna go over there. Like, you know, that, but that's, that's what we have to do. We have to watch and observe and plan accordingly. This is Halifax in Canada. This is a view from my hotel room. This is uh, Canada's oldest urban park. Um, and, uh, you know, the green lines are the original pathways, which is perfect for promenading in the 1800s or jogging or walking your dog or whatever you do. Snow fell, and I woke up to fresh snow, and there was also a bus strike as well, which was even better when you're observing as an urban planner. It's just like the perfect storm. It's like porn, basically. <laughs> and, uh, and I was watching, and I saw just a long line of people on those two red lines, straight as arrows through the snow, carving their desire lines from the new neighborhoods that didn't exist in 1789 to the city center. People on bikes as well. Then it snowed the next night. And I'm at the window in the morning going, yes, okay. And it was exactly the same lines, right? A modern city would stand there going, uh-huh, okay, right. Let's, you don't have to take away the green lines, but you should think about prioritizing the people who, uh, who are using those desire lines. Planning based on desire lines is making illegal behavior legitimate because that's what the people are telling us they want. And if you, if you plan based on their desire lines, you are legitimizing their behavior. And that is the ultimate urban democracy. We really love desire lines uh, at our company. Um, I, I did a lot of research and I was looking for behavioral studies of cyclists. Uh, and I'm searching in a whole bunch of different languages throughout many, many, many decades. And I got nothing. We, the bicycle was so completely normal in all of our cities for decades that we never really thought about studying it. You know, and uh, in the 1960s, you know, uh, with William H. White in America and Jane Jacobs, we started focusing on streets and pedestrians. And but still, nobody was looking at bikes because there were no bikes left in America in the 1960s. But so we took all of these ideas and we said, let's do, let's do, let's study cyclist behavior because it's different, man. And um, this was the first one we did. We film intersections. It's so old school. It's like analog urban planning. <laughs> we film intersections for 12 hours. I have anthropologists come in and just study the animals moving through the intersection because we are just uh, a flock of animals, right, humans. So they just study them, and they, they map out the desire line. Every single cyclist, every single line that they carve through that intersection, and it takes like 200 hours. It's, like so, it's such a bad business model for me, but I don't care. 200 hours of direct human observation. Every single thing is documented. Every human, oh, look what that guy's doing. Oh, my God, that's awesome. You know, and, um, and then we, we make a map like this. But we also start to, we started to mine a lot of data because that's gold. Data is gold. We started to, to really uh, to, to find out some stuff that nobody has noticed in 130 years of the bicycle in our cities. Um, we've looked at over 100,000 cyclists uh, mostly in Copenhagen, but also the city of Amsterdam has hired us to study 10 intersections and we'll tell them how to, how to fix their intersections because they have a lot of congestion problem with bikes and, we, we, and they, they, are going to, they do that. They actually fix the intersections after we study and uh, propose new ideas. Um, so yeah, we've done Barcelona, Montreal, Paris, you know, to have a comparative data set and, ob and, and behavioral set as well. But like some of the stuff we found out, it, it blows our minds. First of all, in every city in the world, even in Copenhagen, people are going, oh, those bloody cyclists, those damn cyclists, breaking the law, complaining about cyclist behavior, you know. And uh, we've, in that intersection there, we counted, six, we measured 16,631 cyclists in that 12-hour period, and that's a slow intersection in Copenhagen. And then 
Nobody in Copenhagen can tell me how many cyclists break the law. You know, we have no data. And so I was walking, I found the data and I, I was asking the mayor and all these other people, I'm going, so all these cyclists in one intersection, how many broke a Danish traffic law? And they're all going, oh, geez, like 35%, 40%. One guy said 70%, 20 And everybody was completely wrong. And that was all their personal perception, right? Cycling, oh, that asshole. Oh, yeah, cyclists are horrible because that one asshole more pulled past me. Nobody had any data. So we found out that 16,631 cyclists, um, only 7% broke a Danish traffic law in that 12-hour period. And really, only 1%. That 1%, we call them reckless. They, uh, they, just, they do all the stuff that we, everybody in the city hates. You know, blowing through the red lights, little old ladies jumping for their lives, right? <laughs> and, um, but then we thought, we were studying. We're not just using GPS or anything. We're actually studying their behavior. We're going, you know what? There's a different group. And we invented the phrase momentumists. Because understanding the transport psychology of the bicycle is something we've never done and something we have to do. If you're on a bike, you, th you, you, you are different. The bike makes you different as a transport user. What's, what's the worst thing that happens when you're on a bike? And I don't mean getting hit by a car. What's the worst thing that happens when you're on a bike? What don't you want to do? Stop. Right. <laughs> like, that's the design of the bicycle. I really don't want to have to stop. Second worst thing is, oh, I have to get off my saddle and stand there and wait for a light, right? This, this, the nature of the bicycle is momentum. And understanding that is key. So we noticed that there's this group called the Momentumists who were, they weren't doing anything horrible. We watched them. They weren't like, you know, irritating anybody. Um, but they were trying to maintain their momentum. This guy, so he was, in, in Copenhagen, we, uh, we do the, the box turn. So if you go to the intersection, you have to wait there and then you continue. You don't go out into traffic and turn left like a car. So this guy, he was coming from like the road up there where the bus is. And he was, he was like going, oh, the light's changing. Ah. And a lot, of, they, a lot of them are doing this. Oh, I'm going to just take the pedestrian crossing, which is illegal. And so he snaked through the intersection in order to turn left. He was just trying to maintain his momentum. And we started noticing people um, who changed their, their physical form. They would take like one leg off, and they would just sort of scoot. I'm not really a bike. <laughs> I'm just scooting. It's, it's OK. <laughs> you know, <whee. laughs> and, and, uh, and then they get to the other side, boom, and then they continue to ride. But this guy was, we started to notice a pattern in behavior. And like I said, nobody's ever noticed this before. Um, this guy, he's breaking the law. He's cycling through a pedestrian crossing in order to go fast from A to B. And um, if you look at him, he's standing up, right? He's not like on, the, on his bike. He's actually standing up. We don't have to be experts in anthropology to maybe assume that if we're doing something that is unacceptable to society, we will cover ourselves, right? We will, you know, if I'm like embarrassed, I'm going, oh God, you know, we, we always try to make ourselves smaller as animals. And <laughs> we, you would assume that somebody breaking the law in broad daylight in a busy intersection would also go, oh fuck, sorry, I'm just gonna cycle this way. <laughs> but the opposite was true. It was so fascinating. This guy, and we zoomed in on all of them, like we're zooming in on all these people because there was a clear pattern. He actually made himself larger, more visible to the flock, right? To the the flock that didn't even notice him, but still. And then when we zoomed in on the faces, it was hilarious. They were, he wasn't like, you know, not trying to avoid everybody's eyes. He was actually like, kind of. they all, not he, <laughs> I remember his face clearly in my head, but uh, all of them were doing that. They all had this like, kind of like a stupid grin. And like, you know, they're kind of looking around, but I'm not right actually making eye contact with anybody. And I'm really large and, and they were being, you know, like, it's like, sorry, I know I'm breaking the law, stop it. <laughs> and then as soon as they hit the legal zone, they just went boom, into the same position. We saw them come down the intersection, uh, oh, sorry, boom. And then they continued off to work or school. And they were being very considerate. They were actually, in their own weird anthropological subconscious way, letting us all know, I know I'm not supposed to do this, sorry, right? That's beautiful, like they were actually being considerate. Um, so it's, it's not just like, that law was broken, right? The police will say, that's a law, it was broken. But you know what, we have to be flexible. We have to start thinking about planning our cities for bikes and understanding the, the transport psychology involved. So this is something, a problem you don't have, snow. Um, but there's also something I call the arrogance of space. And we have had 70 years of car-centric urban planning. 
And we have just completely screwed up our cities with that one focus. But what, this is a friend of mine in the States. Um, he calls it a snack down. If you, uh, hashtags, if you search for that hashtag on Twitter and stuff, it's pretty cool. So in America, uh, a, a neck down is where you have, where you narrow the intersection. So you make a shorter crossing for the pedestrians, right? You sort of, it's like a, a curb bump out also. Um, so he just called it, a, it's a really stupid phrase, but a snow neck down. And he started noticing in the winter in New York where he took these photos that once the snow falls, oh, you can see how much space is not being used by the cars. We gave them all this space and they're not even using it. Look at all this, you know, like a future pedestrian, you know, you could cross to this pedestrian plaza. Look at all, the blue line is the curb. Look at all that space. The cars aren't even touching it. And up at that street there. You know, this is like a total whistleblower, right? This is like the Edward Snowden of urbanism. It's just everything's revealed to us uh, in, in the winter. Um, we're, we have a lot of extra space to play with. The engineers will tell you the opposite, but this just reveals everything. This is a photo I took in Paris. I'm staring down at one of the busiest pedestrian intersections on the planet, all these tens of millions of people going to the Eiffel Tower. And I look at that design. This is classic 1950s, rounded curves so the cars didn't have to be inconvenienced by slowing down. This is how we thought cars should move through a city. And then I, take, I took that home and I do this in a lot of cities. I have some on our blog for, uh, for Barcelona as well. Uh, I just put a filter. Right? Okay, how much space do the cars have? And that's the red, right? Look at all that space that we've given to cars. Um, and then I start slapping, uh, where is it? There. I start doing a lot of, you know, the little, you know, analog data gathering. Look how many, there's only 23 humans using that red space, right? And then you have 26 or whatever, so yeah, 26 uh, pedestrians on their little island waiting to cross to see the damn Eiffel Tower, right? And you got a whole bunch of 12 in the middle. You know, and even you got some purple, there's some sort of little bit of bike infrastructure, not very good, but you know, there's only eight people on bikes. Two of them are on tourist rickshaws. Um, but you know, even when you divide up the space, how much space the cars are taking up, there is still an arrogant amount of space given over to cars. This is, a, some, this is very North American, but in North America, their car lanes, they are so incredibly wide. They're wider than some European countries, literally. They're incredibly wide. You can just like drive and text, you know, and just do this and you'll never enter the next lane. So I started, I'm staring down from a hotel. I do a lot of staring from hotels. You can tell that, right? Yeah. Uh, makes me sound sad, really. <laughs> yeah. No, but I'm looking down on this big one-way street and I'm seeing how wide the car lanes are and I'm waiting. I was there for six days, um, you know, keep looking out and I was waiting for the one vehicle that would fill up the entire car lane and some of the biggest trucks came along, nothing. There, there, nobody filled up the entire lane. So this is their real low-hanging fruit, right? You just narrow the car lanes. And again, with more crappy Photoshop from Michael here, I just narrowed them in and I created 2.5 meter cycle track along the side. They don't even have to take away parking. You know, oh my God, parking, oh no, no, no. You know what, you, don't have, you have all the space you need right there, right? Some of your boulevards here in Barcelona, same thing. All the space is there if you wanna use it. What is a street? It's a facade to a facade. It's everything between the building and the building, right? And for 7,000 years, that's been going boom, 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 back and forth. And then with cars, you know, you know, we widened it. We can do it again. There's no restriction. It's our cities. We can just narrow in the, in the car lanes, narrow in the streets. You know, um, it's, it's, it's all ready to go. This is another photo. This is a guy. You can't see it really well, but there's a guy on a bike. There's no bike lane there. He was just on the side of the traffic. And they still there's still more than enough space in most cities in the world. So I, I travel a lot and I see like really weird shit. Um, unfortunately, too much of it. But this is an example of really stupid bicycle planning. Um, despite 100 years of best practice, which I'll talk about, um, this is an example of an engineer who was told top down from the mayor, we gotta do more for bikes. Hmm. Oh, fuck, okay. Uh, the guy doesn't ride a bike, never will, doesn't care. Oh, you just go out with the measure. Yeah, there's some space there, fine. And then you make, you take away space from the pedestrians, you put in these stupid bollards, and you ignore a lot of space off to the left. There's no, <laughs> this is no regard for human logic or experience or safety. This is just like a lazy uh, engineer 
uh, told to do it, so he did this. I mean, some of, the, some of the things I see around the world, and I'm sorry, some of the things I see in Barcelona are, I mean, this city's trying hard, but especially the new administration, but some of the stuff here, by, first of all, bi-directional, right? Where you, you, that's most of what you have here. Uh, in Danish bicycle planning, we threw that away 20 years ago. It, was, it wasn't safe enough, and we've been doing this for a while. That's just like bad design. Uh, you have bike lanes in the middle of streets here. Like, that is the stupidest thing. That's even more stupid than that. I've never seen anything like that anywhere in the world. There's maybe four cities in the world who, are, who have done it now, and it's just like, you know, there's no understanding of the bicycle as transport when you put bikes out in the middle of the street. I've ridden up and down some of the boulevards with my kids. I mean, and they're just going, like, my, my Copenhagen kids are going, this is stupid. I'm going, I know, right? <laughs> you know, you got to go, like, 30 kilometers an hour to hit the red lights, you know. And, uh, you know, if you live in the middle of the block, and I'm going home from work, I'm going, I live there. Oh, shit. Oh, how do I? <laughs> I'll just walk through the, and go back up the other way. It's just, it's just you know, 100 years of best practice. We know how to do this. Um, so this is bizarre. You know, so also, maybe not so much, uh, you're getting better in Barcelona, but like, you know, America gave us so many great things and technology and stuff. Uh, bicycle infrastructure is not one of them. Um, you know, uh, you see a lot of bike lanes over there and other countries as well in Europe where, you know, you put the bikes in between the door zone and moving traffic. It's the stupidest place to put bikes. Bicycle infrastructure goes along parallel to the sidewalk. And then they invented this called the Shero, the shared arrow. And I, I meet mayors in America going, well, we got 400 miles of a bicycle infrastructure, Bubba. Eh, no, you don't. You have like 100 pictograms painted in the middle of a car lane, and you're calling it infrastructure. It's bullshit. Um, so, I mean, you know, we've had generations of planners who came before us, who did all the hard work, who, who have made all the mistakes, fixed them. We are left with perfect design and best practice. Design is very important. Urban planning and especially engineering, you know, sometimes we get like technical, but let's remember that this is also design. For 7,000 years, we designed our cities without thinking about it. We didn't call it design. We just went, yeah, but we need to do something better at this intersection. Hey, and then we just did it. It was all organic design based on the needs of the people living there at that time. We designed 24 hours a day and we were good at it. So what about if we used basic design principles in our cities instead of only relying on traffic engineering, which we've been doing for a while? You know, designers design for humans. You know, whoever, whatever team designed my smartphone or your smartphone, right? There's a huge multinational corporation who wants to make billions of dollars and euros, but there's a design team going, this phone I really want Michael in Copenhagen to have a good intuitive design experience. And my, my 10 year old daughter should be able to just pick up the phone and go, oh yeah, I totally get this. My 88 year old dad should just go, oh yeah, totally. That is the goal of the designers. It is a human to human process. Engineering is a, is a mathematical model on a computer screen with no regard for humans in, in, in the urban landscape. So what if we design bicycle infrastructure like we design everything, like whoever designed this clicker they were waiting for this day that Michael would be standing here having a fantastic ergonomic experience. Oh, it just sits perfectly in my hand. I can click and I can click. Ah, oh, that's like whoever, whoever designed this is going, yes, wherever they are in Korea or Japan, right? Um, and that's fine. That's awesome. Then I'm, I'm enjoying it. <laughs> it's also kind of, you know, keynote presentation porn, just holding this thing. Um, so what if we designed bicycle infrastructure or pedestrian friendly cities? based on these principles, like we design everything, the clicker, the phone, the computer, the toaster, your toothbrush, you know? What if we did that? You know, what if we designed bicycle infrastructure like, you know, we did like chairs. The chair is one of the most iconic design objects in history. We have examples of somebody interpreting a chair from the Neolithic period. We found it somewhere in the dirt going, okay, some dude had a lot of time on his hands in the Neolithic period. I'm just gonna carve a chair. Maybe I'll make a bigger one. It's like this big. Anyway, we've, we love chairs. And you've all seen stuff like this, right? Crazy interpretations of the chair. Oh, my God, it's a shopping trolley. Oh, but it's a chair. Uh-huh. Oh, an octopus, but it's a chair. Yes. Uh-huh. You can love it or hate it. It doesn't matter. We have a personal perception. None of us have six of these around, you know, our, our living room table for our guests to sit on. You know, none of us, right? Um, if we, compare, if we compare bicycle uh, infrastructure to design and the design of a chair, 
This is probably the uh, cycling map of Barcelona. Uh, it's kind of got some bits and pieces to it. It's, uh, it doesn't really connect up in any cohesive, intelligent network kind of way. There's really sharp edges, so you gotta be careful. But hey, the man is saying you can use it. Look, I'm standing, it works. Just get out there and ride your bike, right? This is a, a interesting interpretation, but again, none of us have six of these around our dining room table for our guests to sit on, because you know what people want? They just want a chair. That's all we want. That's all we've ever, ever, ever wanted in our homes is a chair. And we want it to look nice, and we want it to work. What did you all do when you came in here tonight? You said, you know, hey, how you doing? Keep out. And you sat down, right? You didn't have to take a moment hmm, and walk around the chair trying to understand the artist's interpretation of the chairs you're sitting on, did you? No. You did, there was no on-off button that you had to find. You weren't worried that the chair would disappear from under you like some bike infrastructure in Barcelona in the middle of my talk. You just sat your ass down, boom, right? It was easy and intuitive. And that's what it should be like to ride a bike or a walk in a city. And it's not some crazy theory from Copenhagen. This is something that we're seeing uh, happening around the world. This is the new age of urbanism. And this is what we did for 7,000 years. Let's remember that. Um, I, I know we're talking about smart cities before. For me, the smartest city is not the one that looks towards the future for new solutions. It's the one that walks backwards into the catalog of ideas and dusts them off and go, oh my God, that worked so well for centuries. I'm going to put that into the city. Using technology is great, but we're, we forget to look backwards because there's a whole amazing catalog right there. All people want is a chair. Design is powerful. It seduces us. Do we need the smartphone we have in our pockets? Probably not, but we've been seduced to buy it by marketing, but also by design and you know, uh, user-friendly uh, interface and whatnot. But this is, uh, you know, and the seductive power of objects can transcend other important issues like price or performance. We can get a cheaper phone, but do we have, nah, we go for the, Many, in many cases, uh, you know, the top models. This is my son, he's older now, he's like a teenager and stuff, but um, this is an example of the seductive power of design. So I've calculated that my kids spend about five hours a year in a car. We're not anti-car in my home, we're just in Copenhagen, where only 22% own cars. Cars simply don't come into our conversation. You know, like how often do you talk about the Danish football league? It's very rare for you <laughs> to do that. You know, for us, it's like cars just, we don't even, you know, talk about it. So we're playing this Xbox game a few years ago. He was like seven. And you choose, it's a car racing game. And he's choosing, uh, selecting all these different cars from around the world, scrolling. Oh, daddy, cool car. Oh, daddy, cool car. And I started, I'm going, what, what is he talking about? This kid who has no relationship with cars. And I started to you know, take photos of them. And there are all these kind of cars on the right. All these cars are before 1974. I looked it up. And this kid with no relationship, who never even thought about cars before, he's going, cool car. And he's right. These are awesome. That orange one, that's like my favorite car in the world, 1970 BMW Alpine 2000. I don't have a car, but that, if I did, I'd probably try and get one of those. So this kid was going, awesome design, man. You know, he was seduced by design, to react to a product that he has no relationship with. I think that's amazing. So the seductive power of objects can also transcend stuff like weather. This is not the best day to be riding a bike in Copenhagen, but these people know it's the fastest way from A to B. They've been seduced by the infrastructure, the cohesive infrastructure that takes you anywhere you need to go on every street. And they know that the city will be along in a little while to clear the snow, because this is a really bad snowstorm we had, you know, and they just suck it up. You know, they're just, they're not, there's nothing different about people in Copenhagen, you know, oh, we're Vikings, you know, you know, no, we're just homo sapiens who have to go from A to B, right? There's no cultural difference in homo sapiens. You know, there's cultural influences, but Fast A to B is the key. So they know that things are going to get better. So they've been seduced to use the infrastructure. If you design something beautiful, right, like a chair, you know, and you buy that chair and you put it in your home, you don't let your kids go over with like a felt pen near, near the chair, you know, the Danish design chair, and draw on it or anything. You don't let your cat claw it or anything. You take care of that object. The infrastructure that we have in Copenhagen, it's really, first of all, you can see this is all, this is the network for Bicycle infrastructure on the streets of Copenhagen. It's a network. It's complete. It's everywhere you need to go. Then we also prioritize in the winter 
snow clearance of the bicycle infrastructure first, and we maintain it, like we, you know, we sweep it all through the year. But this is, it's the same map. So in, if it snows in Copenhagen, the bike lanes are done first, and if there's time, you know, and the snow stops or whatever, then they'll do the roads, right? And uh, riding a bike in a city should also be like riding, you know, taking a train. Oh, I gotta, I gotta go, I have a meeting in Madrid, I'm gonna take the Ave at 12, that better leave at 12. I got a buffer for, you know, 15 minutes later or something, but I got a meeting, you know. If, uh, if I had to, like, take the Ave and get off in some place in the middle of nowhere and walk two kilometers to the next train station to wait for the next train, I'm not gonna take the train, I'm gonna fly, or I'm gonna rent a car or do something, right? It has to be reliable. If you have a, the, the beginnings of an infrastructure network in Barcelona, you have, they have to take care of it, and they have to expand it so that it's a network, but what you have here has to be taken care of. It's a beautiful thing we're building, and we, we should, you know, a beautiful design, and we have to take care of it. So we, good design influ influences, improves human behavior. That's the power of design. This is like people waiting for a red light in Copenhagen. In the morning rush hour, there's like 150 cyclists every two minutes, every light cycle in the morning rush hour. It's wild. Um, you know, I often hear, you know, that, oh, the damn cyclists breaking the law. You cannot tell cyclists that, you know, you can't give them shit unless you give them a well-designed bicycle infrastructure network that they deserve. You cannot tell them that they're doing something wrong if you have not designed well. Very simple. It's just, everything applies to many aspects of life. So instead of you know listening to them, people, we react to design every single day of our lives. All of us here. When you buy a toothbrush, you make a design choice. Oh, that's purple. I haven't had a purple one before. Oh, there's a thing with for my tongue on the back. Yeah, yeah I'll try that. You know, you, we made a design choice. When you buy your clothes or whatever, you know, we will react positively or negatively to, de to design. So if you see people riding bikes on sidewalks, you know, in Barcelona, that's because they don't have anywhere else to ride and they feel safer on the sidewalk. Yeah, it can be irritating. I totally I get behind that. But it's not their damn fault. It's the city's fault, right? It's, it's a lack of design. And that person on the sidewalk is reacting to crappy infrastructure. Um, when you scale it up and you design a city well for bikes, People will reward you. They will just wait at the light. Oh, I'll just check my phone. Oh, I need a new song on my, yeah. Oh, it's green, you know. Humans don't want to break the law. You know, none of us. We're a conservative animal, right? I don't look around a city when I'm walking through Barcelona. I don't look for windows to break. <laughs> you know, I don't, oh, that's a cool window. Smash. Oh, I think I need a glass of wine now. You know, none of us want to break the law. Cyclists, people on bikes don't want to break the law. But they're going to do it. They're going to make a design choice. They're going, to, they're, going to, they're going to tell the city with their desire lines and their behavior what works and what doesn't. So it's very important to do the math. But how long is this? How long do I have? Huh? OK. Five minutes. Five minutes. Oh, my god. Um, good luck with that. <laughs> but this is like the Mediterranean, right? <laughs> yeah. OK. So we have so much experience, 7,000 years of urban history that we can go into the archives and take stuff out. We have data from the last 30, 40 years, especially in Scandinavia and especially in Copenhagen. We've just done all the data, man. We just love to measure stuff. Uh, we have experience. We know stuff. And the greatest thing about everything I'm talking about today is that it's all been invented, okay? It's, it's all there. It's a supermarket, right? It's just like I need to make a sandwich. There's bread, meat, cheese, butter, boom. I got a sandwich, right? It's all there for the taking, ready to use today. When I talk about bicycle infrastructure, and I talk about you know the bi-directionals in Barcelona and the weird lanes in the middle of the street and the other stuff around the world, you know, it's, it boggles the mind that you know, in 1915 in Copenhagen, the first bicycle infrastructure was in 1892 in Copenhagen, and then it went whoosh, around the world. Um, and then in 1915, we went, oh, we got to start taking away space on the streets. So the first physically separated bike lane. So in Copenhagen, you have the cars, and then you have a curb for bikes, and then you have a curb, and that's the, where the pedestrians are. So everybody has their space, and everybody knows that that's my space. I'm on a bike. This is my space. I'm a pedestrian. Boom, boom. So in 1915, <laughs> we, uh, we separated cyclists physically on the streets for the first time. What, did we, what has happened since then? Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of cyclists through 100, 102, 103 years have tested that design. If you're talking about, if you design something, you need to test it to make sure it works. We've kind of done that now. We've had a lot of people testing it for us, and we fixed the mistakes, we've improved it, and we're left 
with something useful and also beautiful. Everything. I'm talking about, you know, uh, what the optimal width is. Uh, if you're going up a hill, what, you know, what, what grade you should uh, design for. The capacity. Uh, intermodality, how to connect bikes with buses and trains and everything else. Uh, maintenance, you name it. It's all been figured out by people uh, before us. For example, in Denmark, we really like to measure stuff, okay? We really like to know why we're doing things and if it's going to pay off, cost, benefit, and everything. We know that uh, standard cycle track, minimum 2.3 meters wide, one way on one side of the street, and on every street, there's a corresponding one going the other way. That can move 5,900 people per hour. A car lane, anywhere in the world, can only move 1,300 cars an hour efficiently. That's not even in rush hour. That's like when they're flowing. So, you know, ju we just do the math, okay? And then you have a bus lane here. Okay, what's that? That's like 50,000 people a day, you know, 5,900 per hour. You know, we just do the math. It's, it's really that simple and pragmatic. We need to move people, uh, a lot of people. This is modernizing our transport. This is nothing funky. This is like how we're going to need to modernize our cities. So the city of Copenhagen, one of the richest cities in the world, um, you know, this is how people move around. 62%, if you, have, if you live in Copenhagen and you go to work or education in Copenhagen, 62% ride a bike. That's not a little left-wing group who are trying to save polar bears. That's everybody. That's your doctor. 67% of all the politicians in the, member, in the parliament in Denmark, they ride their bike. It's the fastest way from A to B, you know. 21% uh, public transport. This is in the city of Copenhagen, not the, uh, the metro area. Only 9% drive a car. It's just the stupidest thing to do in Copenhagen, and everybody who owns a car knows it. So they have other options. We create the other options for them. You can't just say, ride a bike, and not do infrastructure, and not, you know, you, you have to actually create the viable options. And then 8% uh, walk. These are the, this is in the, city of, uh, in the city center. This is commuting. This is not going to the supermarket in the afternoon. This is just work or education. So this is, uh, this, is, this is what happens, and it's possible in any city in the world. We know stuff. We know that one kilometer of cycle track, in English we say cycle track when it's separated physically, and then a bike lane is just paint, right? So a cycle track uh, is paid off in five years because of the health benefits, because of the reduction in car traffic and the rise of cyclists and the, uh, uh, yeah, the health benefits on, on that street. We know that for every time somebody rides a bike one kilometer, in Denmark, we earn 20, 24 cents. These are American cents, so what's that, 22 euro cents, whatever. We just pure profit, right in our, right in the, right, right in our uh, pockets. Every time somebody drives a car one kilometer, we pay out 91 American cents. We just throw it into this big black hole and we never see it again. And in Denmark, we have 150% tax on cars. We've had it since the 80s. We've been desperately trying to get some money back from this very inefficient transport form. So if you don't have 150% tax on cars like in Spain, that number is probably even more crazy. I don't even want to know what it is. It's super scary. Um, but we know that this is, it makes sense, right? This is a cost benefit. The factors here are public health. We like to measure everything with public health in, in, in Denmark. So basically, uh, when I ride a bike one kilometer, or you know, I ride my bike to work and back every day, um, I think I do like 12, 13 kilometers a day or something. Um, I'm just making money for society. So I will live longer. I will live on average seven years longer. I will be less ill while I'm alive. So I will be stronger on the workforce. I won't be calling in sick. I will be stronger. Um, well, basically, I will live longer and stronger. And then the goal is that I will die quickly because I die healthy, right? So Michael's going to go long and strong and then just disappear. Because you don't want to sit and pay, oh, God, Michael's on a respirator in the hospital. He's got lifestyle illnesses. How much are we going to pay for this dude? Can he just die? Seriously? So the goal in Denmark is like to live long and strong and then die a healthy death. And that's a quick one. <laughs> and that's good for society as well. You know, instead of making bad lifestyle choices and just people lying like, you know, in the hospital and we're just paying for that, right? Cycling does that. Cycling is, is medicine. It's a preventative medicine for society in so many ways. So here's the numbers. Everybody riding a bike in Copenhagen every day, Copenhagen earns 233, that's euros actually, the number, I know it says dollars, 233 million euros a year in public health savings because we just ride bikes around because it's fast for me to be. Since 
In those 10 years, 2006 to 16, the city has invested 268 million euros over 10 years. I am really bad at math. Everybody who knows me knows that. <laughs> but I can see that that's a really good business model. We spend 268 million over 10 years, but we're making 233 million a year. Like that is probably the most efficient business model for transport in the history of Homo sapiens, right there. That is why we do it in Copenhagen. We don't do it to be green and everything. We just do it because it makes sense and it pays off. And we've measured it, and that applies to any city in the world because it's just people, right? Okay, maybe in America with their weird health system, like they don't factor health into transport. That's fine. But I mean, let's talk about Europe, you know, at least, right? That makes sense uh, in most countries in the world. There's no political opposition in Copenhagen. The right wing in Copenhagen, they will always vote yes for bicycle infrastructure because we can just shove data in their faces. And they're going, okay, fine, yes, fine. Oh, it's really, you know, they must hate it sometimes, but uh, they do it. We just figured it all out. All the data is there. Cycling in any city in the world with infrastructure or without is still 20 times, the health benefits are 20 times greater than any risk. This is my other kid, by the way. You know, so it's, it's, a, it's a safe you know, headlines may tell you something else, but cycling is safe. You know, every year in Europe, 35,000 people are killed by cars, in cars or outside. You know, 35,000. It's like a 9-11 every single month for the past 60 years. And then one cyclist, you know, uh, dies, which is absolutely horrible. But, oh, my God, those damn cyclists. Oh, you know, there's a whole media craziness about that. And nobody is talking about 35,000 people a year every year for 60 years. So we talk about design, Danish, we're, it's a design country, Denmark. My kids have design classes in the third grade. It's, it goes deep in Denmark. Um, we've boiled everything down, all of the work of generations of planners, we've boiled it down to four types of infrastructure. I have the easiest job really in the world. Michael, we need infrastructure for bikes on this street. I asked two questions. How many cars per 20, like in a 24 hour period, okay? What's the speed limit for those cars? Yeah, okay, so that's number two, and I send the invoice. It's not that easy. I'm, I'm working on making it that easy, but it's not. We still have to work. Um, but it's really that simple. So you have residential streets, like also in, uh, you know, here in Garcia and in, you know, in the center of Barcelona. You don't need infrastructure, super low speed, 20, 30K. Then when the speed limit hits 40, then we're allowed to separate uh, with paint, like make a, a wide bike lane, minimum 2.3 meters wide, on both sides of the street, always, never bi-directional, always on both sides of the street. Then when the speed limit hits 50, that's where we physically separate with a curb or something else to, you, you, and you know, you, you give the bikes their protected space. When the speed limit hits 70 and motorway speeds, you get the bikes the hell away from the motorized traffic. You do not mix bikes with cars doing 70 kilometers an hour. It's suicide. Well, no, it's, what's the opposite of that? It's like kill, murder, that's what it is, it's murder. So then we do do bi-directional. <laughs> which is on this graph, but it's only where there are no cross streets, right? So if it's along the harbor, or uh, where's this photo here? Yeah, this is one of the main, one of the motorways leading to Copenhagen. So we have the, you know, it's separated with bushes and fences, and it's the same on the other side as well. Then it's okay to do a bi-directional. So where there's no cars crossing, then it's okay, uh, through a park or whatever. Um, it's that simple, it's those four. People have done the work, like I keep saying, people have done the work and uh, we know what to do here. It's open source, it saves you money, gets you the better results that you really want and that helps you build even more. If you do crappy infrastructure, people are gonna, nobody's riding on it. We spent millions on that and nobody's using it. Oh, it's gonna be hard to scale up to the next level of a bicycle friendly city if you screw up on your first attempt. Use best design from the beginning. Everything we need for designing for bicycles and all aspects of a livable city were all invented at least 100 years ago. But really the only thing that's new for us is uh, uh, bike share, right? <laughs> like the Bissing or the Velib in Paris. This, this came out of nowhere, but that's still, you know, you need infrastructure to be able to ride one of those bikes, right? You need traffic calming. It's, it's all, that's the holy trinity right there. Uh, infrastructure, uh, traffic calming. And, uh, and, uh, and the bike share, you can chuck that in there as well. And facilities for bikes like parking. So we have to listen to the greatest minds. It's really important as we enter this new urban age. We have to listen to people like Lulu Sophia. This is my kid. She and any other kid her age is more clever than this entire room put together, I have learned, believe me. Um, not just her, she's my kid so she's pretty awesome, right? But 
but generally, I'm amazed at kids. So she, I call her the world's youngest urbanist. Uh, and uh, on our blog, copenhagenize.com, uh, if you search for that, you'll find all these articles. She just observes stuff. She doesn't, there's no conversation. When she was three and a half, she just started saying stuff, and I'm going, Jesus, that's amazing. Like, it's like, I'm going, wow. Um, you know, and, and the stuff that comes out of her mouth is, is, like I said, better than anything you'll learn in any education. Like, it's just pure observation. Um, one of the things she told me, or she said to me, was we were walking around our neighborhood, waiting to cross the, the street, and she was kind of quiet. She's like holding my hand, looking around, and then out of the blue, she just turns to me and she says, Daddy, when is my city going to fit me? And I'm going, whoa, what an observation. You know, kids, they must feel so tiny, right? They stare at our asses all day long. How come that can't be good? You know, it's just like, and that's another adult ass. Oh, geez, get me out of here. You know, garbage cans are like basketball hoops, you know? Everything is just like, whoa. And I said, you know, you'll grow. Look at your brother. You'll be fine. She's going, and she's like, she didn't say that, but she's going, it's a rhetorical question, Daddy. Okay, God, <laughs> I know. <laughs> and, um, and, and that made me think, wow, does my city fit me, right? And I'm thinking about Copenhagen, and there's some stretches in Copenhagen. Whoever designed that only thought about Michael, right? I am the king of Copenhagen when I'm cycling there. And everybody else, hopefully, feels the same. You know, I'm the queen of Copenhagen. I'm the king, whatever. Wow, this is awesome. Then there are stretches where, eh, you know, I have infrastructure, but it's like oh, eight lanes of cars and stupid architecture and bad planning and stuff. You know, and most cities in the world, I don't feel like they fit me. But this should be the goal. It's not about scale. You can have Times Square in New York, right? Chaos for traffic. Now they've traffic calmed it, right? They just they made a, a pedestrian plaza. So where there was traffic chaos like six years ago, now there's just tourists eating ice cream. You know, this is nice. You know, and it's still Times Square. So it's not about scale. It's about, you know making us feel like our city fits us. And the, yeah, this is it, the life-size city. This is, um, yeah, I, I call it the life-size city. And it's something we've been doing in our work at Copenhagen Eyes. Um, and it, it's basically, Lulu, uh, my daughter, she's like, Daddy, that thing I said when I was little, is that where you got the name of the life-size city? And oh God, she's gonna get a lawyer now. All right, uh, she's 10, so hopefully not. Um, but no, I have a TV series now, and it's called The Life Size City because there, nobody was doing this either. Curating from cities around the world, you know, all of these amazing things that are happening in this amazing age of urbanism and putting them into one documentary TV series. And we've done that now. Uh, it's a Canadian production, and we're hoping that it will be bought by either a Catalan or a Spanish uh, TV station. It's being shown in different countries around the world. Um, but it really is important. All the stuff, you know, if you're studying here, I mean, all the stuff you're learning is important, but you know what? It's like 5% of what's out there. It's so, I mean, I'm, I'm not dissing your education at all, but it's just like, really, there's stuff out there. And we're trying to curate it. We're trying to inspire people in their cities. You know, they're doing what in Medellin? They're doing, what did they do in Tokyo? We could do that here. It's transferable, right? It, things are transferable. So, the life site. Now, I, on Thursday, I'm actually having a screening and I don't know anything about it. Jordy, where is it? Huh? Architecture College. Yeah. And if you go to Facebook hash, uh, slash Life Size City, the, you, you can see the event there. It's free, right? Yeah. So we're, we're screening two episodes, uh, Medellin and uh, Tel Aviv. We have six in our first season, but we just chose those two. Free. It's in English, no subtitles. Well, you're listening to me now, so I guess that'll work. That's <laughs> fine. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so please come Thursday if you can. Check it out on Facebook. Um, but it's really, you know, amazing to see what is happening. The people I meet and interview, damn, you know, I, I'm stunned. You know, I, I think I know everything, but I'm going, wow, you're doing, you took that and but did that with it? Oh, my God. It's really, uh, that's where we have to go. That's where we have to go. We have to go into other cities. We have to curate. We have to stop saying, oh, but this is different here. We have to realize that we're all, all of our cities are the same, and we can just plop things from Tokyo and Toronto into Barcelona and take Barcelona and throw it out into, you know, Melbourne or wherever, right? So I, Lulu was pretty cool. And then I thought, what, what else can kids do? I'm almost done. Um, what else can kids do? Um, so I went into my son's third grade class and I, with the teacher, and I said, hey, uh, I want to do a little urban planning test. And uh, so I said to the class, um, so there's a thing called urban planning. Never mind that. Like, I, don't, I didn't want to complicate it. I just want to say, yeah, there's a roundabout outside your school, 
we live in one of the most uh, densely populated neighborhoods in Europe. Like, you know, really, you know, Barcelona has even more, but like super tight. Everybody, all the kids use this roundabout every day to go to school. It's really a tight one. It it's, has bicycle infrastructure. It's pretty well designed, but it's still kind of chaotic because of the density. And I said, I want you to figure out how to make that more bicycle friendly, more pedestrian friendly, and maybe think about how people can get out of their cars and tra change transport forms. See you later. See you next week. The teacher, he calls me, he's going, what the hell did you say to them? They were just like, oh my God. It was like, these kids just took this, this challenge and went, yeah, we'll divide up into teams. The teacher was going, maybe you should divide up into, oh, you did that already, okay. Um, <laughs> they, and they just went out and they did drawings uh, on, on, on the, you know, on the site, they did a site visit. They went back into the classroom and discussed, and by the end of the week, they had produced a model out of milk cartons, which was not part of the job, but they said, we gotta make something. <laughs> and so they actually made a model of the redesign of the, of, the, of the roundabout. And this is some of the stuff that they figured out, and I find it fascinating. One kid, he said, why don't you just make cars ugly? This is a real Danish design kid, right? <laughs> make them ugly, nobody's gonna buy ugly things. And I'm going, okay, that's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty logical. But then this is the other stuff. They said, maybe it should be 15 kilometers per hour uh, for cars. And I'm going, how do you know that? They weren't allowed to Google. And they said, I don't know, it just feels kind of slow. And they had no idea that the average speed for all of us riding a bike in Copenhagen is 16 kilometers per hour. So that would be pretty awesome to ride your bike and the car is like, you know, hey, what's up, right? That you, you would feel safe, right? You would not feel like you're being threatened. Um, they said, okay, maybe a fence to separate the cycle track um, from the road, not necessary, but uh, uh, light signals instead of a roundabout, make all the cars do one-way streets in the neighborhood, speed bumps to slow down the cars, and they all agreed that every street in Copenhagen should have glass roofs. So they never got wet in the rain or the snow ever again. They're going, yeah, we're, yeah, whatever, do whatever you want, just do that. <laughs> and, um, but the thing is, look at it. So a lot of these kids have families where, where they have a car. They all ride their bikes and stuff in Copenhagen, but like they, you know, a lot of them have more of a relationship to cars than my kids do. But everything they thought about was the car is the issue here. And they were not told that. They figured that out on their own. They, they used the logic and rationality. They never said, hey, well, maybe we should get the bikes away from that street and put it on a parallel street over there. The bikes can go over there and we can have, the cars don't have to worry about, no, nothing. Everything they were said was, let's do something about the cars. I found that really interesting. And, you know, these, if we only retained 20% of that child logic that we all had when we were little, man, just 20%, we would have very, very different cities, probably very different societies as well. But we lose it. You know, so get in touch with your inner logical child uh, in your work, in your daily life. I can recommend it. So the glass roofs, funny idea, right? But it happens. It's happening right now. In Copenhagen, we have the green wave, which is transport psychology. That we don't want to get off our bikes. We don't want to stop. So on all of the main streets leading to the city center, it's 20 kilometers per hour. And the lights are coordinated. So you ride like six kilometers and you know, on the last stretch, you just never put your foot down. You just hit every single light. Thousands of people just flowing through the city. Talk about like smart cities. That is one of the simplest solutions. Just coordinating the traffic lights for 20K and just pushing everybody in on a technical, technological tailwind. And then it reverses in the afternoon and sends them home. We also have uh, sensors on stoplights in Denmark and the Netherlands now. So if there is like a, a bike lane that crosses a street, not at an intersection, but just crosses, um, it senses if it's too cold, or if it's raining, or if it's snowing, and cyclists get three to four times more light signals. The cars just have to wait, but they're just sitting there with their heater on anyway, right, in the winter time, listening to their music. So it prioritizes, it pushes cyclists, you know, thanks for cycling, get home, you know, quicker, right? So it's kind of, it kind of applies. This guy, the last expert I want to present you with is called William of Ockham, and he's probably one of the greatest urban planners ever. He just didn't know that because he's dead uh, in 1347. But he is responsible for what they call the Ockham's Razor Principle. And this is, it's right there. All things being equal, the simplest solution tends to be the best one. And we use this in our work. We have a big project, we're going, right, let's cut the razor through it. Okay, so you have a whole bunch of ideas on the table, Look at the simplest one, right? We don't do that very much anymore because we live in an age of overcomplication and technology. We design stuff because we can, 
woo, it's exciting, you know? But we don't design stuff because we actually need it, which we did for 7,000 years, right? So we have to be very careful. So use the razor. The simplest solution is probably the best one. So what would our streets look like? If I, would, I really want to do this someday. I'm waiting for some client city to let me do this, but I want to hire third graders, you know, um, what am I, yeah, five-year-olds, some third graders, some young design students, and then, like, you know, use this religious dude uh, to design some streets in a city. I am waiting for this opportunity. What would they look like if we did that? I think they'll be beautiful. They would work, and if all these people are dying every year for 60, 70 years, they would be safer if these kids were given the streets than at any point in the last century. And that is finally taking traffic safety seriously. I was asked a while ago, what is a good road, Michael? And a good road is one where nobody dies and you actually get healthy using it. That should be every road in every city in the world. So yeah, Barcelona is on the Copenhagenized index of bicycle friendly cities in the top 20 in the world. It's also maybe because there's not a lot of a competition yet. Uh, <laughs> um, so things might change. Um, but you know what? It's not about Copenhagen and Amsterdam. Oh, they've been, you know, it's actually about these cities. Buenos Aires, the zeros to heroes. Cities where there were no bikes left, right? Sevilla is the, the darling still after these, all these years. They went from 0.2 of the population riding bikes to 7% in only four years. Buenos Aires, nobody left riding bikes there. Now they're at about 3% in only two years. And uh, Dublin, Minneapolis, minus 30 in the winter. Oslo, big hills, winter. They're just building the infrastructure. There is no chicken or egg. There's only infrastructure. Um, and, you know, these are the cities to watch, right? It's not about Copenhagen because it's going to be a long time to get to that level for most cities. But it's about what the city, other cities are doing, you know. Valencia, well, we're going to be the best city on the Mediterranean for cycling, they've said, right? And, uh, you know, th this is a game now. It's gamification. Right? All the cities in the world are now like in a football league ranking. You know, they're all, we got a super league, you know, premier league, and first, second, third, fifth, you know, and the 10th division. Um, and, but the point is, this is happening. So it's not only Copenhagen, it's what, who else is doing this all around the world? We all work. Yeah, you know, we all live in cities. I mean, we all live in cities. Um, we're studying urban planning or, you know, we, we're all... Are, are architects in our cities of the cities that we want to have in the future. And, you know, like I said, if you design something beautiful, you take care of it, right? And, you know, in Copenhagen, the most famous monument we have is this little naked green lady on a rock called the Little Mermaid, right? And, yeah, whatever. Um, and it was a nice fairy tale by Hans Christian Andersen, but, like, a cool city like Copenhagen, that's all we got? Seriously? I think the greatest monument that we've ever erected is the Bicycle Infrastructure Network. And it never changes. It is all these architects and designers using it differently at every moment of the day. It will never be the same at the twice. It's just completely organic and developing. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. That is our greatest monument. And that's what we're doing. These monuments are rising all over the world. Not just bicycle-friendly cities, pedestrian-friendly cities. We're thinking differently about our cities for the first time in 100 years. And that's what makes it interesting. But let's remember that we're not just putting in the bike lane, you know, we're not just traffic, we're not just making a pedestrian street, we're building monuments. Monuments that are safer than ever before, monuments that will just last for another 100 or 200 years. That is our goal, those of us who work in urban planning, those of us who live in cities. We're all in this together. It's time to rise monuments all over the world. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'll sit down. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Um, I, I don't know if we have the time to Sorry. <laughs> questions. You have, have some questions or comments? Raise your hand, please. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that theory. I'm not saying it's your theory, but I mean, like electric cars solve one quarter of the problems, right? The emissions, right? Like the, the pollution. They still take up an arrogant amount of space. One human is given this huge amount of space to transport themselves through our cities where we 
value our public space. Uh, you know, and parking, for example, like most cars, whether they're electric or not, uh, they are they don't move for 96 percent of their life. <laughs> they're only being you know they're only being driven around 4% of the time. So like you have parking in front of homes, you know, and then you, you, people just get that for free. You know, it's like buying, if I buy a refrigerator and the city comes and fills up my refrigerator with food every single week for the rest of my life. That's what it's like just with free parking. So, I mean, electric cars still need to park. Uh, they still take up too much space. They still kill people, uh, 35,000 a year. I mean, that's not really gonna change that much. A lot of studies about how they're quiet now, so like you don't even hear them coming. There's a lot of issues with that. Um, uh, autonomous cars, uh, I hear, oh, it's gonna change, the nah, you know what, it's still, you know. Oh, but like the cars can travel closer together through the city. One of the only truths from the past 100 years of urban planning, all we really sh should have learned is that if you create more space for cars, more cars will come. If you widen the motorway, you're back to, uh, you have nice flow for six months and then you're back because the time people say, oh, it's quick on the new motorway, boom, and now we're congested again. I mean, it's the same. I mean, uh, you know, if you create uh, autonomous cars that can travel safely tighter, you're gonna have more cars on that road. Um, electric cars uh, only solve one portion of the, of the big picture. Um, I don't mind electric cars. I'm just saying it's not like gonna save the planet, man, or the polar bears, so. Uh, uh, the other questions were uh, regarding the new vehicles that are, are, are rising because uh, in the past we just were watching, uh, let's say, uh, the bikes itself, but now we have uh, mono wheels, we have uh, a lot of uh, pedelec, uh, which are not fully human powered, a lot of people on skateboards. Uh, how can do we integrate these in the, the new urban schemes? Oh, I like to have all the answers, but I don't have the one for that. Um, I mean, it's wild. I mean, the, the thing I, I think with the monowheels and, and like, look at the Segway. Oh man, there's a, if you read about this, if you really research the Segway, this Steve Jobs, this dude, right? Steve Jobs, he put millions into the Segway. He said, this will be, uh, this is like the car replacing the horse. This is the future of urban transport. He put millions, all of Silicon Valley, they just bought into the Segway. Now it's just, the, it's still the goofiest thing you've ever seen, right? Like it never happened. I think a lot of the, the, the gadgets that we're inventing because we uh, can and not because we need them. I'm, I'm kind of like, you know, I'm old dude, so I'm, I've seen shit come and disappear. So I'm kind of going, eh, you know, it'll be, it's a gimmick. It'll last for a while. Um, how do we integrate them? That's a tricky question. Like in Copenhagen, uh, it took a long time for segways to be allowed on the bike lanes. Um, a lot of lobbying was done, and then luckily Segways died. There's only one guy with six of them who does tours with Americans. I don't know why it's only Americans doing the Segways, but um, so we, I never see them. But I mean, uh, like all the other stuff, you're not allowed to skate, uh, skateboard on the cycle tracks, but people do it anyway, you know. Um, it, it's really hard. Let's just see how long they last. <laughs> not skateboards, they've been around for a while, right? But um, yeah, it's, it's, that's a tricky one, yeah. Sidewalk or, or bike lane, I don't know. I mean, I'm kind of like, Regular bikes on bicycle infrastructure, um, you know, the fast moving e-bikes, put them out with the cars, like they're, a, they're basically a motorbike, right, in, in my mind. Uh, we see in, in Groningen, in the Netherlands, really bicycle friendly city, they've had e-bikes for a while now, and they're, uh, they're now separating the bicycle infrastructure. So they're doubling up. This is for normal bikes, this is for e-bikes. And the, the, the planner who's, who I know, he's gone, what a, it's the stupidest job I've ever, like I have to like, I made bicycle infrastructure, now I have to make a parallel lane for e-bikes, which are basically scooters or motorbikes. Like, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of tricky questions ahead with, uh, with all the new gadgets. So I took like 20 minutes to answer and I didn't even actually have an answer, sorry. Yeah. Una pregunta más, la última. Last question. Fine, right? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Uh, you have talked about uh, that people in Copenhagen use the bike because it's quicker to them. Well, I agree too with that uh, question here in here in Barcelona. It's quicker to use the bike, but in my background, people doesn't use the bike because they don't feel like it's comfortable to use it. Uh, more or less is what I see here. And well, mm, so I think that's one reason of beco uh, because people is still using cars. So you have talked a lot about making easier 
uh, to use bikes, about bike infrastructure, uh, why not uh, about making more difficult to use cars like, mm, for example, taxis or, for instance, tolls. Here in Spain, people blame a lot about tolls in highways, and I think it's one of the European countries where riding uh, a, a car is, uh, driving a car is cheaper. And I want to know, well, uh, if you had in your background uh, these measures to tackle the car, like tolls and uh, taxis, and how it was, how was your experience about that? Because here, it would it would be, I think, so unpopular. And mm. if you tackle cars, maybe it's the way to pass this more model share to bike drivers. I mean, there are many cities. Oh, you done? Sorry. Yeah, you were finished. Yeah. yeah so, um, I mean, there's many. Yeah. Congestion charges, right? London, Stockholm, Oslo, um, Singapore. There's many, many cities. So if you enter the city by car or truck, you have to pay, right? And this has had a massive effect. Uh, you, you can Google like what Paris is doing. They have a, a, law, a, a many, a long transport plan to reduce automobiles in, in, in Paris and many French cities also. Uh, th there is road design. If we look at the, the design that I was saying, we can narrow it. Traffic calming is uh, is also making it narrow, um, uh, making it yeah, making it more difficult. I mean, in the Netherlands, they narrow the roads, the lanes, because uh, of safety. If I have a narrow lane, I have to concentrate. And having motorists concentrate in our cities is a good idea. Shit, like I got just a narrow lane, I have to stay between the lines. Like this is actually improves safety. So we can we can do road design. We can change it. Uh, m back to the future again, do what we used to do. Um, congestion charges, yeah, just make it more expensive, absolutely. Um, one thing that's important, and I don't know the numbers in my head, but uh, you know, all the, uh, most of the people driving cars in Barcelona every day don't come from Barcelona. Like if we, I mean, I'm not saying there's anything wrong from being from the suburbs of Barcelona, but like in Copenhagen, it's the same. Copenhagen is here and then we have 22 municipalities, some of them, are really lazy, and they, they will drive their car into Copenhagen. Uh, at seven o'clock in the evening, outside my, house, my apartment on a busy street, we can play Frisbee, because they all went home to the suburbs, right? So, but we are paying a lot of money for asphalt and for facilities for people who just drive down in the morning and drive away. And they don't stop at my local supermarket or my local you know, uh, hairdresser. They go home to do that. You know? So we, we, we've measured all this. So it's also like, who are we doing this for? Uh, the, the boulevards of, of uh, you know, in the city center of Barcelona, I mean, most of the people using them don't actually pay taxes in this municipality, right? And it's the same in many cities of the world. I don't know exactly the situation here, but it, it is the case in many, many cities, right? Especially a large city of, of three, four million. You, you, we're paying a lot of money for people who don't even pay for it, right? So there's that question, right? So to restrict that access, uh, you want to come in and use our nice asphalt, right? Then you got to pay, right? You want to park here? You need, then you got to pay. You're just going to leave a car? You know, that, we could have a bench there. We could have a tree there. But okay, you want to pay? You want to park there? Fine. Then you got to pay, right? It's been a free ride for 70 years for cars, uh, for motorists, and you know now we have to be just pragmatic. We don't have to be anti-car. We just have to be pragmatic. But to answer your question, there's many, many cities again around the world who are doing different things. Uh, Oslo just made. By 2019, in only four years, the city center of Oslo will be free of private cars. If you live there, you can drive a car in, and trucks can deliver goods and go out again. Of course, police and fire, yes. Uh, but if you cannot drive into the city and park to go to work or to shop, in four years. Helsinki, in 2030, you will not be allowed to own a private car in Helsinki. You want a private car? Great. Just park it somewhere else or move somewhere else. But they will have car share, like on the same travel car, for like for the metro and uh, bike share and car share. So if you need to go to the cottage out in the countryside in Finland or whatever, you can get a car, or you need to go to Ikea or whatever. Um, but they, yeah, private ca car ownership, no thanks in 2030. So there's a lot of really interesting things happening around the world. We're still waiting for like, you know, the, the Paris is probably the city to watch the most. They're doing, they're, they're a bit slow sometimes, but they're, it's the most visionary plan of any major big city in the world uh, for reducing cars. 
you know, you can Google that. It's really super interesting to see. So we know what, again, we know what to do, you know? It's just, uh, if you know, a lot of politicians think, you know, oh yeah, well, you had the cars. A lot of politicians don't actually have the stats. You know, they, they think that all those people driving cars are people who will vote for them. <laughs> Most of them don't, they can't even vote for the, that politician in that city, right? So we have to be, just be realistic. And always we have to educate our politicians and uh, we have to do it with rationality and data and we just have to know more than them, which isn't hard most of the time. <laughs> Very inspiring talk. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. And remember, we have a glass of wine at the hall. I'm gone. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.